National Coalition of 100 Black Women, West Palm Beach Chapter, Community Health Education Talks. We would like to take the opportunity with this program to highlight health issues in our community. Good evening. Welcome to the Health Spot. Today is Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. My name is Charlotte Leonard, and I am the co-host of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women's Health Talk. The National Coalition of 100 Black Women is an all-female volunteer organization. Our purpose is to advocate on behalf of women and girls to promote leadership development and gender equity in areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. This month is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. So our guest is going to share with us this month education, information, and resources around Alzheimer's disease and how it is impacting our community and how we can help those in our community that are suffering from this disease. So now I'd like to turn it over to my co-host so she can introduce our guest speaker for this evening. So Sabrina, take it away, introduce yourself and let them know who's joining us tonight. Good evening, Facebook family and friends. My name is Sabrina Blue Cooper. I am the co-host for tonight's um, NCBW Health Spot. Tonight, we are honored to have with us none other than to Questa Austin, who will give us some dynamic and well-informed information on Alzheimer's. So with that being said, we're gonna jump right into it so that Ms. Austin can have all the time that she's gonna to need to give us some very informative information. So if you will introduce yourself to us tonight and explain your role as a community educator. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for that. And good evening, everyone. My name is, again, Sequesta Olson, and I'm a master level social worker, and I work as a community educator in outreach with Brain Matters Research, located right in your back door at Delray Beach, Florida. And thank you so much for asking me to join you this evening. I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to get straight to it. Well, first, we want to talk about, you know, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the importance of brain health, the basics of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, what we can do to help our community move forward in this disease. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of brain health. Brain health is one of the most important prevention tools that you can provide to yourself and your family. Let's talk a little bit about what I call the eight pillars of brain health. And I call it, let's activate your brain. Activating your brain, we need to know that aging causes changes in all parts of the body. Most of us can feel it now, including the brain. And research does suggest that there are things that we can do as we get older to keep our brains as healthy as possible for as long as possible, which allows individuals to be, remain independent as possible. Now, our brain health is supported by my eight pillars. And I want you to know that these pillars will help you reduce your risk of cognitive decline as you get older. Now, indeed, studies show that the best results are when multiple approaches are used, in fact. So let's briefly talk about that. Number one, you want to stay active. The best approach to staying active means get some exercise, simply. It helps you feel better, gives you more energy, helps you sleep better, and it strengthens your body and your balance. Second, Let's eat well. Now, all of us have known about trying to change our diets and eating better, but foods that are good for your heart, remember that, overall, are good for your brain. Those are your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your nuts, your lean meats, your fishes. They are wonderful for the brain, and you get vitamins from those as well. Third, let's talk about sleeping well. Now, I hear a lot of my seniors talk about they don't sleep well. Well, getting a good night's sleep not only makes you feel better, more alert, more energetic, 
but it has a long-term effect on your health. And if you find that you're up two and three times a night, well, other than going to the bathroom, then you might need to talk to your primary physician about your inability to sleep soundly because you may be affected by what's called sleep apnea. And that's something that needs to be diagnosed by your physician. Fourth, let's exercise the brain. People say, what is exercising the brain? Well, just as your body needs exercise, so does your brain. Now, stimulate the mind with mentally challenging activities such as reading, playing games, doing puzzles, learning new things, take on a hobby, even try volunteering. It is excellent exercise for the brain. Fifth, let's stay connected with our friends and our families because we all know during COVID times, we were all isolated and it really had a great effect on a lot of folks. And I tell you, st studies have shown that across the lifespan, those individuals that had a better social engagement, it was linked to a lower rate, a lower rate of cognitive decline. So that tells us that we need to stay connected with friends, families, and all community activities that you used to do. I hope that we're back doing those. Now, six, we want to relax and reduce our stress. Now, we know that chronic stress is known to damage the brain and causes problems with our memory. Now, the mind and body approaches that we all hear about, believe it or not, they work, such as meditation, yoga, Tai Chi, it's great for the brain and the balance. It also helps to reduce anxiety and depression. So let's make sure we learn to use those mechanisms of relaxation and reducing stress. Seventh, we want to control our risk factors. Now we all know what they are. A lot of us are experiencing a lot of age-related cognitive decline, which is influenced by our risk factors. Some of us genetically have risk factors such as hypertension, okay? But for the most part, risk factors will include diabetes, hypertension, obesity, depression. Come on, folks, we have got to get better. We have got to take our medication. We have got to eat well, which reduces your risk factor, sleeping well, staying ex with exercise, all these things in combination are powerful in reducing your um, level of brain cognition. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about this in the end, research. Research is powerful. So by engaging in brain health, it then becomes a part of your lifestyle. And there's no cost involved in brain health, only your time. So, Let's talk about some of the basics of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Dementia is simply a severe loss of cognitive function, your ability to think, remember, and reason. Now, with that being said, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. Folks are always asking, well, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is just one of many forms of dementia, the most prevalent one that everyone recognizes. Now, when it comes down to what causes it, researchers have made great strides toward better understanding what causes Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, yet the jury's still out, it is unknown. And we're trying to understand the underlying process meaning that's involved in dementia because there's a lot of complexities that interplay like genetics. There is a genetic predisposition that's been identified. The APO4 gene, your lifestyle. Of course, everyone asks about environmental factors. So, you know, when people ask, well, you know, how it causes it, I'll be honest with you. Research is still out on that one. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the symptoms, okay, of dementia. Dementia symptoms can include symptoms simply like problems thinking, reasoning, memory, judgment, and possibly even planning. You have a difficult time learning new skills. If someone is having that difficult time, you may 
think about, maybe they're having challenges with their memory. Maybe even if you see a change in their mood or behavior, which is out of the norm, you might need to think about that. Sometimes you will find out that their ability to speak, understand, and get words out. They know what they're trying to say, but they just can't get it out. They have difficult times as well, staying focused and paying attention to things. Now, all of us heard of people asking the same questions over and over again. Be patient, be kind, be gentle, because that person is probably dealing with memory loss because they're not retaining the information when you say, Joe, we have an appointment at three o'clock tomorrow. You may tell them again, Joe, we have an appointment at three o'clock tomorrow, but Joe may ask you several times, what time is the appointment? When is our appointment? That's just a signal right there that that individual may be having some difficult times, difficulties with their memory. So what are we gonna do about that? We're going to get them to their primary. We're going to talk to the primary physician and say, mm, I've noticed mom or dad or even myself are having difficulties. I'll be honest with you, most primaries will talk to you about your memory you know, only if you bring it up. Very seldom will they ask you if you're having memory problems. But be your own advocate, okay? When you go into that physician's office, have yourself ready and armed with all your questions. Don't allow the physician just to tell you because that physician is there for you. So please utilize them at your best. If they do not feel as though that you have memory loss, you say, well, how do you know? How about a test? They should be able to give you a test. And today's tests include more than asking you who the president is. There is a more involved test and those tests should be given to you over a period of once a year so that you can see the changes in your memory if there are any. So with that being said, keep in mind about Alzheimer's disease and the symptoms so that if you have a loved one that may be and you think may be having these symptoms, let's get them to the primary doctor because sometimes they may not have Alzheimer's. They may have some, something else. Because I want you to know that vitamin B deficiency, as well as loss of hearing, if you can't hear it, you can't process it. So people are looking, like you, looking at you like something's wrong. So you need to know that there are other things that mimic memory loss, such as depression, over-medication, vitamin B deficiency, like I said, or even an inactive thyroid. So this is information that you need to arm yourself with so that you'll have more to go ask your physician about. And if your physician can't answer it, then you need to ask them to refer you to someone that can. And most times that is a specialist called a neurologist. Neurology covers a lot of different neurological diseases. So you want to make sure you find someone that is special is memory loss as well, because there are neurologists out there that focus on one area of specialty. That would be your go-to person. Now, we want to talk about just basic Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is really a disease of aging. Everybody doesn't get dementia, folks. It's just a disease of aging, and most times, if you have not succumbed to memory loss, by the age of documented 85, but since we're living a lot longer now, I say 90, then nine times out of 10, that individual will never have Alzheimer's. Now, there is what's called normal aging. People do age normally. Notably, everything in our body ages as we age. So the brain ages too, which means that they are going to respond to you maybe a lot slower and or we need to be patient and give them more time to think about what we've asked them. But nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be right. And if it's right, if they don't think about it now, they may think about it later. We all have memory lapse. How many of us have walked into the room and said, oh, my God, what did I walk in here for? And have to walk back out to remember. OK, we all do that. That's called benign forgetfulness. 
It doesn't mean we all got to mention. What it means is that we have a lot of distractions in our lives, okay? And a lot of us try to do a lot of multitasking. There comes a time in life where you have to slow down and you're not able to do all that stuff you used to do and slow your brain down so that you can process everything you need. So as our seniors, I call them seasoned seniors, as they go on in life, please be patient and allow them to opportunity to get what they need said. Most times it's gonna be in a response to what you ask them. It just may take them a little bit longer to respond. So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease, okay? Now, Alzheimer's usually starts 10 or more years before anybody even gets any symptoms. It's amazing how that disease sits there and we call it stewing and brewing, but you won't get any real symptoms maybe till 15 years after that if you are affected by the disease. The disease comes along with what's called amyloid and tau, which is on the brain. And when that amyloid and tau glumps on to your neurons, it blocks the method of communication with one another. So then your neurons don't have anything to communicate with. So slowly there goes your memory. Now, is there a treatment for Alzheimer's disease today? Mm. There are treatments, but there's no cure. Keep in mind, people that start off very slowly in the process with just mild memory loss, they may get a diagnosis of what's called MCI. That's also known as mild cognitive impairment. It is a stage between normal cognition and more serious symptoms that may indicate dementia. But keep in mind, those individuals may have problems with their thinking, their judgment, their memory, even some language, but it doesn't significantly interfere with their abilities to conduct their activities of daily living. So they go on living normal lives. Now, MCI is the precursor to Alzheimer's disease, but not every person diagnosed with MCI goes over into Alzheimer's disease. A lot of times there has to be a significant event that affects that individual that will carry them over into Alzheimer's disease. But there are a lot of folks living a long, healthy life with just mild cognitive impairment. Now, there are many, many types of dementias. You know, we want to, we just want to keep focus on what that definition of dementia was and is. But there's so many other types. I'm sure you've heard of dementias like Parkinson's dementia, um, vascular dementia, frontal temple dementia. Um, there's all kinds of dementia. Most times people with vascular dementia, it's related to a stroke. And we're all familiar with that word because it has attacked the vascular system. It's one of the slowest moving type of dementias. A lot of folks live a long life. Yes, they have dementia, but most times they're functional, very functional with supervision. You've got, you know, and, and these dementias, they can go on and on and on. But I want you to know that the most prevalent one is Alzheimer's dementia. You've heard of Lewy body's dementia, which is related to Parkinson's, Parkinson's-like dementia. Now, you know, we have a lot of people that are trying to take care of folks, you know, that have illnesses. And we really, really want everyone to also know that this month is National Caregivers Month, where we celebrate what our caregivers do for loved ones. And I want you to know that being a caregiver is not an easy task. Most of us have been caregivers, even though we may not think we've been caregivers. Trust me, you've been caregiver since your children were small. And little did you think that you were gonna to have to be a caregiver for one of your loved ones, family members, neighbors, friends. But caring for someone with dementia can be very, very hard, both physically and emotionally. So what we have to do is learn how to take care of ourselves as caregivers. We want the caregivers to stay healthy 
We want you to take care of yourself. Get regular health care. Don't, don't bypass your checkups. Ask your families and friends for help in case you need them to run errands for you. Arrange for respite care. Respite is when you get someone to come in and help you on a short-term basis. And I want you to know that for the most part, if you have a diagnosis of dementia, you qualify for many, many resources in the community. And one would be some form of hospice because they provide respite for you. And the respite can be weeks at a time just so you can catch a break. Also, spend time with your family and get someone to come in with that respite so you can go out and, and do, enjoy yourself. Run errands. Um, go have lunch with a friend. Most importantly, I think you should join a support group. Support groups are great for caregivers. As a matter of fact, I lead a support group for caregivers and persons that have early onset dementia as a volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. I am a champion educator. So I am out and about on a regular basis providing education about Alzheimer's disease. Also, as a caregiver, if you are a caregiver of a loved one, please make sure you have all affairs in order. You may not need them now, but we never know what tomorrow brings. So seek an attorney and get advice on what you need for end of life because Alzheimer's disease is a terminal disease. Although the four medications that they use to only treat the symptoms are Aricep, which most of you have heard about, Namenda, Rivastatin, and Glamatapine. Those are what they've had on the market for years to only treat the symptoms. And they do work for some, but not for everyone. And it's short term and it is, does not modify the disease, which means it doesn't change anything what's going on on a long-term basis. Now, you know, we've talked a little bit about brain health. We've talked about Alzheimer's disease, what you know, how to recognize symptoms. You know, we want you to understand that these are only recommendations. And based on my experience, of 20 years of working with Alzheimer's patients and in research, one of my most joyous things that I'm doing today is working in research. One of the biggest things that I do is I go out in the community and I educate our black and brown community on the importance of getting involved, staying involved, first by taking care of their brain health, knowing that they too are part of the solution Next, I'm educating them about Alzheimer's disease. Then I go and educate them about what's on your plate. What are you doing to make sure that you're eating healthy? And I challenge the brain with many games, with a mindset class that helps individuals to remain mindful because distractions are around us all the time. And those distractions keep us from being mindful. Being mindful most times mean that you are thinking and noting about what you're doing as you do it. Because I tell you, those distractions, we get so many of them, we lose track of what we're doing. We think about now, oh my God, I was doing that. We have to slow down as we age. It's just the facts of life. So with research, I suggest that everyone involved go out and get a free memory screening. Once you reach the age of 50, it is recommended that you start adding memory screening onto your other screening, such as you get your cholesterol screen when you go for your checkup, you get um, your high blood pressure screen on a regular basis, um, you get your blood sugar levels checked when you go, if you need to, on a regular basis. Now it's time to add screening your memory to that. We recommend you screen your memory once a year after your first memory screening, you should be able to get a baseline on what your memory is. And then you will compare that baseline each year going forward, hoping to see improvement and stabilization with your memory. 
If by any chance you have a family member that might have succumbed to the disease of Alzheimer's dementia or is living with it right now, you may consider talking to your primary about getting a referral, if you need one, to a specialist so that you can see if there's something that they can do to help. At Brain Matters Research, we have 23 clinical trials. We are the largest research site in North America that specializes in Alzheimer's disease located in Delray Beach, Florida. So, and believe it or not, everything that we do there is of no charge. So if you're really concerned about your memory, you've had a loved one that had the disease and you're concerned because there is a genetic predisposition, the APO4 gene, we have simple clinical trials where you can come and get a blood test. Just that simple. Also, we have clinical trials for those that have mild cognitive impairment, moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, and prevention trials. So today, think about how are you going to make a difference? Keep in mind, how many blood pressure pills do you take? If you take more than two, that ought to tell you that you need to be a part of the solution because that medication is not made for our biochemistry. We're taking medications because the doctors are giving us whatever he has available that he thinks would be able to help keep our blood pressure down. And to be honest with you, a cardiologist is the best person to work with your blood pressure if your blood pressure remains unstable. He knows what to give you for that. That's that specialist you may need. So keep in mind, research is one way to get what we need. The only medicine that's been developed by for our brown and black community has been for sickle cell. Do you know why? because it is a disease that is predominantly by African, with African-Americans. So with that, they had to come up with something. So let's get through the fears and walk through our faith and say, what can I do to make a difference today? How can I make a difference so that my children will not have to face this disease? And my grandchildren, all they'll have to do is maybe take something or a vaccine or with prevention, they can break the chain. We can break the chain. So I want everyone to please stay steadfast. Remember, every pill you take, someone has sat in that chair to make sure that it was safe and that it worked. And we need to get through this fear of not being involved. Because if we don't get involved, then we have nothing. And we cannot complain. And we can, will continue to suffer taking lots of drugs because nothing has been designed for us until we go to the table, ladies and gentlemen. So with that being said, I wanna say thank you so much for allowing me to share with you today. If you have any questions, resources, I will make sure that I put them in the chat, as well as if you need any support, you can always contact the Alzheimer's Association at alz.org. Or if you like to come in for your free memory screening, you can contact me at Brain Matters Research. We don't charge you a thing, okay? Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much to Questa Austin for providing us with this such valuable information about Alzheimer's. And again, we wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate us on the Alzheimer's and the disease that it affects us, how it affects us. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Charlotte Leonard now and she will close this out. Thank you again. Yes, I felt like I needed tambourines, like, a, you know, and just kind of shake every time you share it like a little nugget. So thank you. That eight pillars for brain health. I'm taking notes. That was very insightful. Also, I love the fact that you explained the difference between dementia, Alzheimer's, those symptoms, what we can look for. I even learned that there's a, a better test or a more extensive test for your memory. I did not know that. So thank you for sharing that. But one of the things I wanted to close out and make sure that we share with our community, you did talk about a support group that you lead. Do you, can you give us where, when, and what time is that support group so that those that are interested can hopefully get in touch with you and become part of the solution, or at least talk through some of those fears? 
Absolutely. My support group is on the second Wednesday of each month from 2 to 3.30, located at my office, Brain Matters Research, located at 800 Northwest 17th Avenue, Delray Beach, Florida. And you can reach me at 561-374-8461. And my email address is T A. L S T O N at E R G, the word clinical.com. Thank you so much. This has um, been very enlightening. I love the fact how you tied in research and how important it is for our community to get involved with finding solutions for, for us, those brown and, and Black people that are being impacted by this disease. So again, on behalf of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Sabrina and I and all of us, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for sharing. And please be well and go get some brain health. Yes. <laughs> yes. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. Uh -huh.